Well, would you pray with me here this morning? Heavenly Father, we are here this morning and ever aware of our need for you and our dependency upon you and uh, our gratefulness to you. Uh, Father, we are here to worship you. We are here uh, to express as best as we can a growing love for you. And we pray that you would increase that in our hearts and increase that in the life of the church here. Help us to grow in our understanding and our knowledge of the depths and the breadth, the height, the width, the total expanse of your love for each and every one of us. And then help us to grow in our love for you flowing out of that, and then our love for others. Uh, we commit this time to you, Heavenly Father. We commit this to you, Lord Jesus. Ask that we honor you here this morning. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would reign here in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives. And may your word be exalted in these moments, I pray. Now, Father, we commit this time uh, in your hands, in the precious name of your precious Son, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, over the last many years, it's been 24 years actually, I have been growing and still growing in my role as a parent of four children. I don't think we ever stop learning as parents. Uh, we never stop learning the incredible lessons that we need to learn as parents as they advance in their own development. But if there's one thing I've learned along the way, it is this. Children are persistent. Ask any parent and they will tell you that this is true. Children know how to get our attention. We may fight it for a while. We may try to put them off for a while. We may try to ignore them for a while, but it doesn't work. Children are incredibly, undeniably, sometimes drive you crazy, persistent. How many of us have been through this? And maybe it's been a few years. Maybe your grandparents now, and you've got the little grandchildren, and you, it comes back quite quickly. But it's late at night, and you've just fallen asleep, and then you hear this little voice. Mommy. Mommy. Now you hope you're just dreaming. You try to ignore it. You hope it goes away. But we all know children. It doesn't go away. It only gets louder. Mommy. Daddy. And so finally you say, well, what is it? Can I have a glass of water? And you respond, you've already had enough water for the night. And then you say, please try and go back to sleep. And they do so for about a minute. And then you hear, mommy, I'm really thirsty. And what happens next is amazing. We get up, we get them something to drink, we pat their little back, and then we go back to bed and we sigh a big sigh, and then we start to actually pray that they'll make it through the night. I have noticed that children learn this at an early age. The minute they start breathing, you take a little infant and they know how to be persistent. They cry until you calm them, they cry until you feed them. They will cry until you change them. They will cry until you hold them. And they will cry until you gently rock them to sleep. And so what do we do? We hold them. We rock them. And we do this because from the depths of our heart and the depths of our being, we do it because we love them but we do it because they are so persistent. Well, we could learn something from our children when it comes to such determination. In fact, Christ calls us to behave in a similar fashion when it comes to our relationship with God. 
He reminds us that we should have the same relentless pursuit of the spiritual necessities for our soul as a child does for the physical necessities of life. He reminds us that we should have the same kind of passionate resolve when it comes to the matters of prayer. And so this morning, what I want us to see in the time that we have is that sometimes, sometimes, the best way to get God's attention is to simply behave like a child. Sometimes the best way to get his undivided attention is to simply act like a child. I want to read Matthew 7, 7 through 11 once again so that it settles within our soul. And we're going to get a portion of it this week and we're going to look at the second half next week as it relates to prayer and as it would relate to a, a childlike faith. Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be open. For what man is there among you when his son shall ask him for a loaf? Will give him a stone. Or if he should ask for a fish, uh, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask? of him. This is one of the glorious passages found in the pages of scripture that warms our souls. It's a passage that reminds us of the character of our great God and our great and glorious God. It's a passage that reminds us that his promises are true, that his love is unending, that his faithfulness is eternal and is perfect. It's a passage that calls us to a deep sense of commitment in our pursuit of God. It's also a passage that has come with a few perils along the way. It's a passage that has often been misused and misapplied, and it's had damaging, damaging results. As often is the case, how we approach the scriptures absolutely determines how we apply them. There are many who take this passage out of context, and certainly out of the context of the Sermon of the Mount, which is very important as we look at this passage. And they interpret it to simply mean this. Ask for it, and you're going to get it. Seek, you're going to find. But if you ask, if you ask, if you pray for it, you're going to get it. If we ask enough, seek enough, knock enough, God's going to give you what you ask for, give you what you seek for, give you what you knock for. And that kind of name it and claim it theology redefines the very nature and the very character of God. And we begin to redefine and we begin to, to mold him and cast him into our own image. And as a result, when we do that, he's no longer sovereign over the affairs of our lives. He's no longer sovereign over the, the plans and the paths of men. He's no longer the one who rules. But rather, God is demoted to some kind of celestial slot machine. That if we pull the handle the right way and the numbers are allowed exactly the way we want them, we will get the big payout. Or some kind of divine genie. That if we just caress him the right way, he'll come up out of the bottle and we'll get exactly what we want. If we rub him the right way, he'll do what we want. If we ask him the right way, We'll get what we desire. God will provide me enough money. God will change my spouse. And God will heal my body. But what happens when the money doesn't come? What happens when the husband doesn't change? And what happens when the body still aches? And what happens when the child doesn't come back home? What happens when life remains the same? Will people become disappointed with God? 
When that happens, we begin to doubt his word. We begin to doubt his promises. We begin to doubt his character. And then we start to doubt his love. And then we start to doubt his care. And rather than running to God, the tendency is we begin running from God. And tragically, the only time that our faith is strong is when God hands us what we want. But when he doesn't respond, when God is silent, our faith becomes frail. I think we need to know that Christ would never teach anything that would cause that type of reaction. The focus of Christ's teaching this morning is to cause us to turn to God in faith, to trust him with our lives and our needs, and to come to him with the faith of a child. Christ is pointing to the process of spiritual transformation in this passage. Not the material wants and the needs, though they, they are in there, but at the core, at the heart of what Christ is teaching, he's trying to get to the heart of us and to the heart of transformation. He's focusing our attention upon our need for God's help to become like his son, to live out all of the principles that, that he instructs us in the Sermon of the Mount. In the Sermon of the Mount, Christ is continually calling us, challenging us as kingdom people to live in light of kingdom principles so that we make a kingdom impact in the world in which we live. He's continually calling us to be different. If you know anything about the Sermon on the Mount, in fact, I'd encourage you to read it this week all the way through. It'll take you 10 minutes, shortest sermon you ever heard. But it'll say, you've heard this. You've heard it said this, but I say to you this. You've heard, don't murder, but I'm telling you, if you even get angry in your heart, you've heard this. You've tried to massage and manipulate and manage the truth of God, and you've reduced it down to what you can contain and compartmentalize. But I say to you, it goes deeper than the law. It goes to the heart. Anyone who properly understands this sermon recognizes how impossible it is to live like this without him. We can't do it without him. It becomes dry, it becomes dead, and there's no life in it. It's unnatural for us to live the principles taught in the sermon. In fact, we do the opposite. Christ calls us to be humble. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, tokas, poorer than beggar poor. The lowest of the lowest of the lows. To be humble, but we want to be proud. Christ calls us to be meek. We want to be macho. He calls us to be peacemakers. We by nature are troublemakers. He calls us to protect our marriages. This world tends to pursue divorce. He calls us to purity. We gravitate towards that which is profane. He calls us to be holy. And we far too often embrace that which defiles. He calls us to love. We have a propensity to hate. He calls us to be compassionate. But we tend to judge in the worst of ways. He calls us to be salt and to be light but we tend to mix in with the world and hide our light. And the rays are diminished by the lifestyles that we live. And so verses 7 through 11 are couched in the context of our needing divine help to live a life that is a reflection of our Lord. And so if we're going to live as kingdom people and live in light of kingdom values, then we need the help of the king to have any kind of kingdom effect and kingdom impact. And so when it comes, get this, when it comes to getting help for our souls, when it comes to getting help for the things of eternity, when it comes to getting help for kingdom advancement, sometimes the best way to get God's attention is to simply behave like a child. Christ reminds us that when we pray, but especially when we pray for our spiritual lives, we are to pray 
with the persistence of a child. Listen to what he says. Ask, it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Each term is progressive in terms of its intensity, in terms of its energy, and in terms of its effort. Now Christ moves us from a simple petition to an active persistence to an aggressive pounding. First we are to ask. Well, the whole idea of to ask outright, to appeal, to request, but it's stronger than that. It carries the idea of to even demand. Now that's staggering to me because how do I approach a God who is so much bigger than I can even imagine and demand anything? But that is what Christ is asking us to do. Then we're to seek, it gets a little stronger, to strive after, to search for, and to seek after. A technical term used by the Greeks for seeking after knowledge and seeking after wisdom. A judicial term meaning to investigate or to deliberate over something. By way of application, for us to strive after, to deliberate over the things of eternity, to deliberate, to contemplate deeply the character and the wonder and the attributes of God. That is what Christ is calling us to. And then to knock. Now, here's the idea of to knock, but to knock, to knock hard or to pound. It carries the idea of a person beating down the doors until they can enter in. Now, when my daughter was younger, in fact, all four, but my daughter especially, was younger, we used to love to play hide and seek. I liked the job of hiding. as She would seek. And I would find creative ways to hide, and as she would discover me, I would, you know, ratchet it up just a notch, so I'd go hide in the closet, and I'd mean, I'd really hide in the back corner of the closet. And my daughter Christina would go around the house and go, Daddy, where are you? Daddy, where are you? Well, I'm in the back of the closet. After a while, I'm starting to get bored because she's going around and around and around. I'm like, I'm going to be here all day. You know, she's in the bedroom, she's under the bed, she's everywhere but where I am. Daddy! So finally, I hear little footsteps. Da -da 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 -da. And I make a little noise in the closet. You can almost hear their little, my, little, my little girl come back to the closet door. Daddy, are you in there? Daddy? I make a little more noise. Daddy, are you in there? Boop, boop, boop. Boop, 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 boop. Daddy, get out of there. It's that kind of imagery. Each term is what the Greeks would call a present imperative. It means two things. First is to be a continuous effort for each term. So we don't just ask, but you ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Daddy, 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 dad, daddy, get out of there. Secondly, it's an imperative command from Christ, meaning do this and do this now. Now, there's some technical terms, so don't get lost in that. But the, the imperative is the idea of the imposition of one person's will onto another so that you move them to action. So I, as a parent, are looking out the kitchen window. I see my son playing in the street. He doesn't see it, but I see it, and I start to see the car coming down the road. And so from the kitchen, out the window, I yell, Will, get out of the road! It's the imposition of my will upon my son to get him to move to action and to get going. And that's what Christ is calling us to do here. Ask. It, can you imagine our Lord telling us to get into a place to demand from him? Ask. Seek. Knock. Go ahead. I can handle it. I can take it. I can do it. You have my full permission to beat down the very gates of heaven and approach the throne of God. Hebrews tells us that we are to race into the presence of God, to run, but to literally leap into the Father's arms before the throne of God. And scripture says with confidence and with boldness. What Christ is calling us to is an ongoing process of persistent prayer. 
What Christ is calling us to do is to be people who pray like there's no tomorrow. Have you ever noticed how our prayer lives change when a family member is sick or is dying or there's an emergency? Have you ever noticed how the focus of your prayers change? Have you ever noticed how the intensity of our prayers change when there's an emergency, when there's life on the line? We don't stop. We pray until we're worn out. We pray until we weep. We pour our hearts out before God. I lost my mom to cancer 10 months after my wife and I got married. And I remember I was at some friends and my, my uh, stepfather made the call. I knew, that, uh, my mom, I, I knew that my mom was sick. I did not know how sick. And he called and with tears. The only time I've ever heard him cry was he made that call. And he says, your mom has cancer. I went home. My wife will tell you, I, I fell into the bed. And I, and I wept. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And it wasn't as much a praying, Lord, help her to live. You know, I want her to be with me. I want her to see our kids. I want, I want, I want. It was there. That was there. But I'll tell you what was really there. Father, please save my mom. All of a sudden, her soul came to the forefront because I knew she didn't have a relationship. And I asked, and I sought, and I knocked, and I knocked, and I knocked. And before her life passed on, she accepted the Lord. One of the great joys of heaven is not just seeing my Lord and my Savior, but seeing my mom. And through that process and her death, my older sister came to faith. Sometime later, our prayer lives shift when the matters of eternity come into focus. And we see this kind of diligence in Luke chapter 11, uh, verses 5 through 8. I want to watch the time here, but Luke chapter 11, 5 through 8. And I want to read that as well. It'll be up on the screen for you. And again, our Lord is speaking eternal truth. Um, Luke chapter 11, beginning with verse 5. And he said to them, Suppose one of you shall have a friend, and shall go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I've got nothing to set before him. And from the inside he shall answer and say, uh, like we'll all say, Are you out of your mind? Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed, and I cannot get up and give you something. But I tell you, even though he'll not get up and give him anything, because he's a friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And he says, I say to you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. And so our Lord provides an illustration, a little story to help us get it. It's a friend who's in need, but his friend is in deep sleep. It's late at night, his friend is hungry, he has no food, so he goes to his friend's house. He says, hey, you're my friend, I got a friend from out of town, I've got some needs. It's late at night, his friend is hungry, they don't have any food. The lights are out, all is quiet. The house is locked down for the night. Literally, the doors are shut or closed to stay closed. Now, what you have to understand in the Middle East at that time, it took a lot of effort to lock everything down. We just shut the door, we lock it, we hit the bolt latch, put on the lights, and we're good to go. But in that culture, in that time, it took a lot of work, a lot of effort. In addition, two-thirds of the house was at ground level. It was your, your first raised ranch, or split level, if you can imagine. One-third was raised, and that was a sleeping area. 
Oftentimes, mom and dad went up, the children were up in the top third. In the lower two thirds was a fire. But they would also bring in some of their prized animals, not the dog, not the cat, but maybe a sheep or two, and they would bring them in and they would bed down as well. So for anyone to get up, they would have to wake the entire household up. And so the owner says, literally, stop furnishing trouble to me or trouble me not. The visitor says, get up. His friend says, I can't, I won't, go away. But where friendship fails, persistence prevails. And he keeps pounding away. Here it's a different word. It's used of a shameless persistence, perseverance without regard to time or place. And as a result of the man's persistence, the homeowner, res homeowner responds to the need. Now, if you listen to what followed on the heels of that, the same exact expression uh, as the passage we're looking at in the Sermon on the Mount, that kind of relentless, persistent prayer is the kind of prayer that God responds to. Now, here's the tough part of the teaching. We will pray like this when we want something or if we have some pressing need. Christ is calling us to pray like this for the things of eternity. We're to pray with this kind of persistence for the souls of men and women and children. Not just in the church, but in the community in which we live. To be asking, to be seeking, to be knocking. We're to pray with persistence for the transformation of our own lives. Christ is calling us to pray with all of our hearts to know the heart of God. It's the kind of prayer that cries out, Lord, help me to be like you. Not in a legalistic performance kind of thing, but the deep yearning of the soul that knows I'm in the best place I can ever be. When I'm like the Apostle John, leaning upon the very chest of Jesus Christ in the upper room, so close to the living God, he could hear the very heartbeat of the living God. As the deer pants for the water's brooks, oh, how my soul longs for you, O oh Lord. If we don't understand it that way, it becomes a bunch of religious gymnastics that I have to work through and that I have to run through. He's not calling us, to, he's not up there saying, you know, I'm having a good time. Why, why you're knocking your brains out, trying to get my attention that somehow if your knuckles are bloodied, I'll finally hear from you. And until then, I'm, I'm, I'm deaf to your pleas and I'm, dry, I'm, I'm, I'm blind to your plight. So just keep beating on. You know why he calls us to this? Because the more I do this, the more I look, the more I seek, the more I knock for that, that change in my life, but, but also for him to use me in the life of another person. The more I'm praying like that, the more I start to become, I start to become passionate for that. The more my heart is breaking for the soul of another, the more I'm in a, a great place to be used of him. To re He's trying to get my heart. It's not about me trying to get his. It's me being there and being reminded throughout the day that someone needs him. Someone probably wants him. They just don't know how. And then recognizing, Lord, I don't know how to do this. I'm not confident in it. I don't have the courage to do it. I know you want me to, but, 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 but. And the Lord's like, I'm with you in this. Watch me go to work. I just need you to be ready for me to do the deep work. It's the ache of the soul 
that longs for the presence of God to be displayed in their lives. It's the ache of the soul that longs for the things of eternity and to be used for his eternal glory. God calls us to call out to him when we need his help to help us live a godly life. And when we pray with the persistence of a child, God will help us to mature as an adult. It's like the psalmist in Psalm 25. Make me know thy ways, O Lord. Make me know them. There's times I don't want to. Make me know them. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. You teach, I learn. You lead, I follow. For thou, thou art the God of my salvation. And in thee I will wait all the day. The great saints of old have prayed prayers like this. Our Lord doesn't need us to keep beating down his door just to make us work. It's some cruel game of hide and seek. He wants us to get into the place where we can hear him. He wants us to be so intent on seeking him, we won't settle for anything less. He wants us to be so focused on pursuing him with a persistent passion that we find our souls and our spirits saturated with him. And that we find ourselves in the best place to be used by him and to be used for him. I thought, well, what can we pray for in the days, of head, days ahead? And certainly, uh, how we and how you could be praying in the weeks leading to Resurrection Sunday. And so let me give you a few thoughts here that you can ask, that you can seek, and, and you can knock. And so I've listed them there for you. Here's something we could be praying for. For the Lord to fill the pews this Resurrection Sunday. Now you've got social distancing and so forth. And so you say, well, what happens if God does that? And we've got to say six feet away. Well, I'm sure we can figure that one out. But to fill the pews, to, to bring people into the fold, not just here, but through YouTube, all kinds of things. The people who never thought about visiting the church, find themselves online on YouTube and they hear the message of all messages. Pray for Paul as he prepares to deliver. But pray that God would move in this community. And not just fill this church up, fill the churches up. And to see something take place. For the Lord to open our eyes to the harvest around us. I guarantee if you pray this every day and you stay on top of it, God is going to open your eyes and you're going to see some things you hadn't seen before. For the Lord to add to the body those gifts we need to grow. And we ask and we seek and we knock. Not just bring people in. Bring people in that have the gift of evangelism. Bring people in who have gifts of mercy. I think you have a whole bunch of that here already. Gifts of hospitality. That it just drives them crazy if they can't help somebody. For open doors for each one of us to share the gospel with another human being. Every one of us. You say, well, that's daunting. That's a little frightening. It is. But if you're praying like this and your focus is on him, he'll move you right into it and you won't even know it's happening. For the Lord to transform our lives. To become more like him, to look like him, and to love like him. For the Lord to use me to invest in the spiritual life of another, to mentor them, to disciple them. For the Lord to use my life to bring him absolute glory and advance his kingdom. Here's the thing. We pray like this each and every day and throughout the day. Can you imagine what that will look like when God answers these prayers? And oh, by the way, that's the second half next week. I want to close here. 
But Christ has more to say. And more to say about how we pray. And we're going to discover that next week as we look at the second half of this great message. Because we're going to focus on not only how we pray, but to the one in whom we pray. Now, we pray with the persistence of a child. But next week we're going to learn we pray with the confidence of a child. Can we pray? Father, we give you glory. We give you honor. We worship you. And we thank you that you not only give good gifts to your children. <laughs> that happens because at the core of who you will always be and eternally be, you are good. And you are great. So we bow before you this morning. Help us, Father. So there's not a burden, but it's a blessing. It's not a hard time, but it's a time of wonderful oasis where we drink deeply of the things of you. Thank you for the opportunity here this morning. I pray, Father, in the weeks ahead, may your presence be abundantly known and your power absolutely evident and we pray as we move towards resurrection sunday all eyes will be on your son i pray in christ's name amen